and welcome to yet another extremely topical and extremely timely AMET webinar. As many of you know, AMET is a premier Washington think tank and policy shop. Our nation's policymakers have learned to rely upon us and trust us to offer timely, accurate, nonpartisan education about the Middle East on Capitol Hill. Our efforts have made a difference and we daily educate members of the Senate and uh, or um, their staffers and member of members of Congress or their staffers. Um, our aim is to move the needle a little bit with every meeting towards empathy about what Israel is up against and the dangers that they are up against in that extremely perilous neighborhood in which they're forced to live. Looking back, we know that we have made impactful changes to help create a more secure future for both Israel and the United States. And we also know that in the minds of those that despise Israel, the minor Satan, they equally despise the United States, the great Satan. We get absolutely no government grants from any nation and rely entirely on viewers such as yourselves to keep us afloat. We ask you to please kindly consider making a tax-deductible donation to AMET at www.ametonline.org. Some of you who are repeat customers to our AMET webinars have already heard from the wonderful um, Emmanuel Otolenghi, where you've learned about Iran and particularly the penetration of Hezbollah networks in Latin America. Ever since the Khomeini revolution of 1979, Iran has not only attempted to overthrow the um, secular monarchy sorry, um, from within, but they also have attempted um, to re um, replace it with a, a suffocating theocracy from within and with one of the worst human rights records in the world as well as attempting to export the Shiite Islamic revolution abroad. The Iranian and Hezbollah presence is growing stronger in the tri-border areas of Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil. And there has been more recently a growing presence in the tri-border area of Chile, Peru, and Bolivia. We've also been noticing the importation of Iranian missiles and drones to Venezuela missiles and drones that are capable of reaching the United States of America. On May 13th, an interesting event occurred when a mysterious Boeing 74, 747 cargo plane made its way from Caracas, Venezuela to an airport in Chadur de la Este, Paraguay. What made this so mysterious was that this cargo plane carried absolutely no cargo it did carry, however, 18 passengers, 11 Venezuelans and seven Iranians, at least one of which is known to be a senior member of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. And later on, on June 8th, another mysterious plane with a Venezuelan flag on it landed in Buenos Aires, um, carrying a crew of 14 Venezuelans and five Iranians, including at least one high-ranking Iranian official. On Tuesday of this week, the U.S. Department of Justice requested that this plane be transferred to the United States because, according to the Justice Department, it was um, transferred from the Iranian airline Mahan Air, which officials have alleged um, provides support for Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Quds Force. What is exactly is going on right under our noses, just south of our border in Latin America? We're extremely honored to have with us once again today to answer this question and others, Dr. Emmanuel Otolenghi. Emmanuel Otolenghi is a senior fellow at FDD and an expert at FDD's Center on Economic and Financial Power. CFP, focused on Hezbollah's Latin America's illicit threat networks and Iran's history of sanctions evasion. 
His research has examined Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, including its links to the country's energy sector and procurement networks. His areas of expertise also include the EU's Middle East policymaking, transatlantic relations, the Arab-Israeli conflict, and Israel's domestic politics. Prior to joining FDD, Emmanuel headed the Transatlantic Institute in Brussels and taught Israel studies at St. Anthony's College of Oxford University. He is the author of The Pastoran, Inside Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, Iran, the Lumen Crisis, and Under a Mushroom Cloud, Europe, Iran, and the Bomb. Emmanuel, Emmanueli, I'm sorry, blogs at the Hill. His columns have also appeared in leading outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and London's The Sunday Times. He obtained his PhD in political theory at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, preceded by undergraduate studies in political science at the University of Bologna. So it is indeed a pleasure and an honor to have you with us, Emanuele. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind introduction and for the opportunity to be back uh, on this prestigious forum. And good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, I'm going to go directly to uh, today's uh, topic, uh, and I hope everybody can see my screen that I just began to share. Um, the mystery cargo plane that you just mentioned uh, is, of course, uh, uh, in focus in the news uh, again this week, uh, certainly in the English language press uh, after the Department of Justice uh, took action to order uh, the seizure uh, of the plane. Um, but of course, this is a story that began, as you mentioned, two months ago, when that aircraft initially landed in Ciudad del Este, in the tri-border area, uh, with a crew of 18 members and no cargo, and spent three days on the ground before flying out without the Paraguayan authorities ever uh, really doing anything serious to inspect the plane or question uh, the crew, flew out to Aruba with a cargo of cigarettes and Paraguay is the epicenter of cigarette contraband in the Western Hemisphere and the, 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 the leading manufacturer of the cigarettes that get contrabanded all around Latin America is the former president of Paraguay, Horacio Cartes, whom the Department of State sanctioned uh, two weeks ago for his significant involvement in state corruption and obstruction of justice. So there, are, there is an enormous amount of moving pieces to the story and a lot of mystery. And I'm gonna just touch upon it briefly, but I want to put it into the broader context of what Iran is doing in Latin America, which uh, uh, is a lot of things. And today I wanna to focus on the aspect of uh, influence operations, radicalization, indoctrination, and of course, support of terrorism, all of which intersect and may have a lot to do with the plane visit. Now let's begin from the plane. Um, what you see on the left side is a tweet by an Iranian aviation uh, social media expert who back in January of 2022 announced, so this was public knowledge, that Mahanair, the Iran ostensibly private carrier, which is uh, for all intents and purposes, the IRGC airline transferred an old Boeing 747 um, that is about 36 years old to a newly established cargo airline owned by the Venezuelan Conviasa, which is under U.S. sanction. Now, the new airline, Entresor, takes consignment of this plane, and as the Iranian social media aviation guru tells us, 
the aircraft will be operated by an Iranian crew. And on the right-hand side of the screen, of course, you see the end of the story, the uh, August 2nd announcement by the Department of Justice that they're issuing a warrant to seize the plane that has been grounded in Buenos Aires since June 8th uh, and was uh, seized uh, at least temporarily by local authorities pending an investigation into terrorism. And the reason for this is that since this cargo airline, Emtresur, began to operate on its maiden journey of February 11th from Minsk, Belarus to Caracas, much of its traffic and travels uh, do not seem to be of a commercial nature. We know many details about two flights, the one to Ciudad del Este and the one to Buenos Aires. When you look at the details of the nature of the cargo that the plane was transporting or the fact that there was no cargo at all, the costs of the flights, uh, the nature and value of the merchandise transported, the amount of time spent on the ground, the size of the crew, nothing makes sense from a commercial standpoint. And from the very beginning, those monitoring this uh, mysterious uh, uh, cargo operation that went to a lot of strange destinations. Emtresur, before getting to Ciudad del Este and um, Buenos Aires, uh, flew uh, numerous times to Myanmar, for example, to India, to Pakistan, to Moscow, and of course in the Western Hemisphere to places like Nicaragua, Cuba, which are, of course, uh, ideological fellow travelers and allies of the Venezuelan regime and the Iranian regime. In most of these cases, the plane stays on the ground for a lengthy amount of time. And the implications and probably most compelling theory, which awaits confirmation from the ongoing investigation by Argentinian authorities, is that what we need to focus on is not the cargo that the plane carries, but its passengers. That this is a cover, a disguise, the latest disguise to facilitate the free and unfettered travel of senior officials uh, from Iran and since Emtresur began operation also of their Venezuelan partners to different places in the world where disguised as a crew, these senior figures of the two regimes can you know, move about without, um, you know, visa restrictions and meet contacts, develop sources, potentially provide material uh, resources and instructions to contacts to support ongoing or future operations. And the reason we suspect that is this gentleman that you mentioned. You can see at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen the list of passengers for the flight that arrived in Ciudad del Este on May 13th. The captain, uh, Golam Reza Gassimi, who was also the captain for the flight to Buenos Aires, and he's still uh, blocked from leaving the country uh, in Argentina as of today, um, nearly two months after the plane arrived in Buenos Aires, is a long time, um, not just pilot, he is a pilot, but member of regime uh, operations. He's a former IRGC officer. He was the chairman of an airline owned by Iran's Ministry of Petroleum. And since 2018, he's been a shareholder and a senior board member, uh, as well as a manager for another airline, Fars Air Keshem, which Treasury sanctioned in 2019, and which has been involved in the transport of weapons, equipment, both to the Syrian regime and to Hezbollah through Syria, but also since February has been regularly flying to Moscow. And all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the recent accusations that the US government made against Iran that they may be getting ready to sell drones to the Russians to support Russia's uh, wanton war of aggression in Ukraine. 
The fact of the matter is that cargo flights run by the IRGC, a company linked to the gentleman whose face you see on the screen, have already been flying to Russia back and forth since February. And so the supply chain from Iran to help Russia uh, continue to try and crush the Ukrainian resolve to preserve their independence has been ongoing. And this gentleman may have had a role in it. So all of this is extremely suspicious and feeds into the assumption that what this plane operation was about is not cargo, is not commercial transfers, is not making money, but it is using a commercial facade to move senior intelligence uh, officials from two regimes that have for decades now supported subversive activities and terrorism all over the world, but specifically in Latin America. And this fits into a broader context that today I want to share with you of how Iran has built over decades a very resilient uh, and widespread network involved in influence operations to recruit supporters, to expand its influence, to connect with local like-minded leaders and political movements, and in the process to advance its worldview in the region, spread the ideals of the Islamic revolution, but also gain enough influence and, and friends to shift the policies of the region in a direction that is decidedly anti-American. Latin American networks for Iran serve multiple purposes. Spreading the revolutionary ideologies, one, recruiting and strengthening a cadre of loyal followers, establishing operational bases, train the followers both in soft and hard operations, and by hard I mean infrastructure for potential intelligence gathering and terror operation. Soft means really propaganda influence operation. Persuade and recruit key opinion influencers. So it's not just about their religious followers and the converts that they gain along the way, but also reach out to um, ideologically aligned members of the press, of the political class, of academia, religious leaders, NGOs, and so on, to recruit them and make them part of a broader alliance that shares the same worldview of Iran, mainly in the field of opposition uh, and hatred, opposition to and hatred for America. Now, of course, these uh, alliances have been established in a very um, creative way, always looking for groups that consider themselves disempowered. And so, for example, uh, Iran has reached out to indigenous movements across uh, the region, but also the extreme left uh, where it, it is active. And of course, leverage support from friendly governments where they can be found. And of course, Venezuela is one, Nicaragua is another one, Cuba is a third and Bolivia to a large extent, even after Evo Morales left, um, in order to create and, and develop an eco chamber of institutions that amplify the propaganda of the regime, but also build a network of sleeper cells. A lot of the people who come to participate in these soft power activities may also be linked to a lot more nefarious, illicit, activities. And of course, these institutions that they establish in turn become the infrastructure that facilitate travel of Iranian agents through various fronts. The meat inspectors, and this is an old story, but you know, Latin America, especially the Southern Cone, uh, is one of the largest world exporters of beef and chicken. And the Islamic world uh, is a consumer of halal meat, and it's a two billion consumer market. So there is a cover to send meat inspector for halal meat. Iran has used that. Clerics for the local religious communities and their institutions, but also, as we've seen recently, airplane crews uh, in order to uh, have a cover to send agents uh, on the ground. 
these infrastructures over time, of course, uh, generate self-funding to continue to support and expand activities. And they're also there to intersect, coordinate, and cooperate with existing Hezbollah networks. Now, at the center of this operation, there is one institution in particular, the University of Al Mustafa, Al Mustafa International University, which uh, Treasury sanctioned in December of 2020 for its role in hosting and training um, members of the Shia uh, Pakistani and Afghani militias that the IRGC Quds Force deployed in Syria. Uh, in the fight uh, um, uh, to support the Bashar al-Assad regime there. But al-Mustafa is a lot more than a place where these people train. It is the epicenter of Iran's project to export its revolutionary values um, overseas. Um, now, this is uh, an instrument that it was developed over time, but Iran began its operation in Latin America as early as 1982, when it started sending uh, clerics to the region. Uh, and of course, over time, Al Mustafa became the center coordinating these activities. It has a department that just focuses on Latin America. The leader of this department is Hojatul Islam Mohsen Rabbani. Many of you may recognize the name because he came to Argentina in, two, in 1982. He was the first cleric sent by Iran to Argentina. He served for many years as the Imam of the Shia Mosque in Buenos Aires, the Al Tahuid Mosque. And then he became the cultural attache of the embassy in Argentina and was later implicated by the investigations led by the late uh, Argentinian prosecutor Alberto Nisman in the AMIA terror attack. And it is the evidence provided by the Argentinians that made it possible for the Interpol to issue a red notice against Rabbani in 2007 alongside other, uh, other members of the Iranian regime and of course of Hezbollah. And so here you have a clear example of how the soft power and the hard power subversive activities of Iran merge into one person and one operation, and it's always hard to tell where one begins and the other one ends, but they're clearly uh, intertwined. And today, Rabbani, who no longer can come to Latin America, is in charge of a place called Islam Oriente, which is a department of Al Mustafa, and they produce uh, Spanish and Portuguese language literature. They coordinate proselytism activities across Latin America, support activities for the network in Latin America to export the revolution. Al Mustafa was established in 2007, but it had uh, a number of um, uh, uh, theological seminars that fulfilled the same function before, and they were merged as one at that time. And since then it has um, uh, trained and uh, educated more than 50,000 students from 122 nations, uh, including many who went on to extend their stay and studies to become clerics. Uh, and once ordained, these clerics go back to their native countries in order to lead the Iranian-backed, Iranian-funded network of Shia cultural centers and mosques. So, what Iran has basically done over the decades is train a cutter of native language speakers for numerous countries around the world who are highly motivated, radicalized, and speak the language, understand the culture, uh, so that they can maximize uh, the work of uh, uh, spreading the message of the revolution. And you can see this is not a small operation. Uh, the university has an $80 million annual budget. It employs 3,500 teachers. It has organized over time more than 5,000 cultural and religious events. It has 4,000 internet platforms and blogs in many languages. It produces 300 cultural publications in, in 40 languages, and he has foreign permanent branches abroad. And in Latin America, uh, the main are to be found in Caracas, Venezuela, and Bogota, Colombia but it has also centers elsewhere. We have identified many, most, uh, most of them are in Argentina 
and Brazil, where you know longest history of Iranian presence or largest community, but there are also centers in Bolivia, in Chile, in Colombia, in Costa Rica, even in Cuba, which is not known for welcoming missionary activity and, and promoting religious freedom, and countries that are both adversaries and friends of the United States, such as Ecuador, El Salvador, Mexico, Peru, and so on. Uh, through Al Mustafa, Iran has also taken this a step further. It has established scientific cooperation agreements with several universities, including in Venezuela, in Argentina, and in Bolivia. And these cooperations allow Iranian academics to come and teach in these universities. It allow exchange programs for Latin American teachers to travel to Iran and so on. And it is so important that there is now and now Mustafa permanent representative in Caracas alongside the Al Mustafa front institution and of course the, the embassy. So that is a sign of how central Venezuela, of course, it is to these operations. Now, the three main leaders of this operation are Mohsen Rabani himself, his son-in-law, uh, who goes by the nickname of Sheikh Komi. Um, and a number of, of other uh, clerics, some trained uh, from Latin America, some Iranian or Lebanese who speak uh, fluent Spanish. Uh, but the other key figure is an, is an Argentinian uh, of Lebanese origins named Edgardo Ruben Hassad, who goes by the Arabic name of Suhail, who has been the main engine behind establishing the early centers in Argentina, in Chile, who's established the center in Cuba and who spends half the time in Iran and half the time traveling in Latin America to expand the networks. Um, the, uh, a lot of this uh, work that Al Mustafa does uh, is under the direct supervision of this, the office of the Supreme Leader through a Shia Iranian institution called Ahlul Bayt World Assembly. So it, this is not an academic institution, really. This is an instrument of the Iranian regime under the direct control of the Supreme Leader of the Revolution. Mohsen Rabani is not just a teacher or the center director. Uh, he is the personal representative of the Supreme Leader in Latin America as well. Um, he is an advisor for international affairs and a teacher at the campus in Qom. Uh, and of course, the cooperation with the Ahlul Bayt World Assembly is extremely close, and it extends to a parallel effort by the Assembly to establish centers as well in Latin America. You can see on the right hand side the, the example of the recently established center in Foch to Iguazu, the Brazilian side of the tri border area. And the director of that center, Ali Fayad, is the son of a Lebanese, uh, Brazilian, Paraguayan uh, national, Sobhi Fayad, who was sanctioned by Treasury in 2006 for being a Hezbollah financier. So here you can see how the highest uh, offices and institutions of the Islamic Republic of Iran, their propaganda activity, and the Hezbollah terror finance network all converge in one operation. What does Al Mustafa, Al Mustafa do? They do seminars, they bring people over for lengthy trips, usually two months, that include both tourism, pleasure, and learning. Um, they select the most talented and committed students to become clerics. They use them to proselytize in Latin America, create affiliated centers. Um, the, the clerics, of course, become leaders. Um, but then they also go on to promote um, academic cooperation, local media platforms, uh, publishing houses, cultural uh, associations, which then uh, spread the revolutionary ideas through literature uh, and, uh, um, and they promote events, of course, to uh, extend and expand Iran's message. And recruitment is a central element of this, of this uh, effort. And here you can see an example on the right-hand side. It's in Spanish. It's an event from December 2017 in a uh, publicly owned municipal cultural uh, um, uh, center 
where uh, you know the public is invited to learn about you know firsthand about Islam and Iranian society, um, promoted and sponsored by the local authorities in Argentina, organized by the uh, local Shia mosque and its cultural association. And you can see at the bottom that it says uh, at this event, we, an explanation will be available um, to those who, um, you know, uh, uh, who wish to, um, uh, to support the promotion of travel to the Islamic Republic of Iran. These activities are meant for recruitment purpose uh, to bring in new followers, uh, to convert them to Iran's revolutionary doctrine, to Shia Islam through Iran's lenses. Um, and this is, of course, done by offering scholarships uh, to bring people over. Iran fully founds the strips with many activities that I've described. And the purpose of this trip is to cement the bonds of loyalty. And what's interesting is that a lot of this trip bring students and converts from all over Latin America together. So the idea is to create a continent-wide network by making them bond on these very powerful, lengthy immersions into the ideology uh, and experience of Iran. So then you no longer have Shia Peruvians, Shia Bolivians, Shia Argentinians, you have Muslim Shias who are Hispano hablantes, they speak the language, the, the, the languages of Latin America, and they embrace this idea that the borders don't count, they're all part of the same revolutionary community. So it is a continent wide network. And of course, uh, this is the goal because it, it becomes most effective. And that, that is why part of the process involves identifying and promoting uh, the training, uh, not just of loyal followers, but of learned uh, clerics, a cutter of clerics who are local, as I explained. This is an ad published by the Shia Center in Bogota, Colombia, with a photograph of Sheikh Komi, uh, promoting scholarships uh, for Islamic studies for men and women interested in becoming sheikhs, professors of Islamic sciences, and, uh, and professional uh, educators. And we see the results. This is a photograph of a Brazilian convert named Everton Regini, who is, uh, uh, as of April 2016, he's in Iran. Here he's photographed with uh, Moxen Rabbani. The occasion is actually Regini's wedding that Rabbani himself officiated. And fast forward to 2022, um, uh, Sheikh Regini is now a teacher at the Mesquita Azahra Shia mes a Mosque in uh, the city of uh, Guarapuava uh, in the state of Paraná in southern Brazil. So you can see the trajectory and he's not alone. Here's just a, a random samples of, of, of converts who have acquired degrees in Islamic sciences, have become clerics uh, from a variety of countries. On the right hand side, you see uh, one of them who um, was the leader of the Ahlul Bayt assembly uh, in Bogota and uh, a Shia imam uh, and uh, um, and also uh, the head of the center. And he left that position um, earlier uh, this year or late last year to actually become a political candidate for Fuerza Ciudadana, a left-wing party that supported Gustavo Petro to the presidency. And this is another thing that they do. Part of these very motivated, indoctrinated recruits try to enter local politics in each and every one of their own countries so that they can become agents of Iran's message within the political system. And some of them su succeed. Uh, Borrero, fortunately, was not elected, but others do get in as local uh, municipal council members, um, advisors to politicians. Recently, one of uh, the Iranian graduates 
was appointed as an advisor to one of the new ministers in the government of Chile. So there is a design here that starts from the recruitment, goes on with the training, the conversion, uh, the indoctrination, um, the selection of the most talented ones, and then the channeling of these people to specific tasks that include uh, influence ops within the political arena. And all of this is supported by a lot of literature. Here is a screenshot from Islam Oriente um, that produces all sorts of propaganda material that goes from the highbrow, academic, lengthy scholarly articles all the way to news. And you can see, uh, even those of you who do not speak Spanish, you can see this selection includes an article about Malcolm X, who was a anti-imperialist Muslim who was neither left nor right, a strong, typical message of the Iranian worldview, or an article about uh, Qasem Soleimani, uh, or an article about the international Al-Quds Day, um, a, a propaganda yearly event that the Islamic revolution has promoted since uh, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini took power uh, in Iran. Here's a screenshot of the Islamic uh, uh, um, journal Causar. You can see the combination of Islam Oriente, the Assemblea Mundial, the World Assembly, Ahlul Bayt, with Moksen Rabbani as the editor. Now, this is a screenshot of the front page of the journal at the other end of the spectrum, a journal for children age four and five called the Los Angelitos, the Little Angels, which again, it's Iranian propaganda to indoctrinate from the very early stage. This document was found during a raid against suspected Hezbollah narco-traffickers in Ciudad del Este in April 2017, alongside other material, including two translations uh, of uh, the Quran in Spanish, one from an Islamic center in Venezuela linked to Iran. And part of the reason that the Arabic speaking uh, traffickers had this material in Spanish is that they married local women who did not speak Arabic, who converted to Islam. And this was clearly educational material for their spouses and their non-Arabic speaking uh, relatives, including their children. Um, the extremism that Iran sponsors is not just a you know, particular interpretation of Islam, you know that, but it's worth showing. One of the books that they translated into Spanish is uh, by Roger Gaudi, a uh, French uh, pseudo-historian well known for his Holocaust denial writing. This is um, a screed uh, uh, against uh, the state of Israel. This is something that Al Mustafa does uh, uh, in Latin America. Um, this is a book that has had quite a bit of success, uh, written by an Iranian uh, uh, scholar, translated into Spanish. It is basically a celebration of the life of Iranian arch-terrorist Qasem Soleimani, um, and it is designed for specifically for a young teenager audience. And as you can see, you can buy it on Kindle. So this stuff gets around. Um, here is a gallery of examples of celebrating the life of Soleimani and commemorating him. This is the promotion of the book uh, on Hispan TV, reposted by uh, a publishing house called El Faro, based in Colombia, run by two Colombian converts to Shia Islam through the Al Mustafa network. This is a eulogy and memorial message by the director of the Centro Cultural Islamico Imam Hossein in Rio de Janeiro, Carlos Meneses, a convert to Shia Islam through Al Mustafa and one of the translators of Islam Oriente's material from Farsi to Portuguese. And here's more material. This is from Argentina. Uh, two events commemorating in one case uh, the martyrdom of Soleimani, and in the other case, the revolution uh, 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 anniversary from January, February of 2022 this year, very recent. All of the people involved from Al Mustafa. 
Here's a photograph of Sohail Assad. I mentioned already his role. He's meeting a, a nativist Inca uh, separatist movement in their offices in Peru. And I want you to pay attention to the photograph on the right, what's encircled in red in the uh, top corner on the left of the photograph. This is an Inca Peruvian nativist separatist movement. And yet they have the portrait of Iran Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei in their office. And this is because of the patient work by Iranian emissaries to build relations, probably to fund these types of movement and to indoctrinate their members to believe that Iran is their ally in the fight and resistance against the oppressors that uh, uh, rule the earth. The fight against global arrogance, the fight against anti-imperialism, they call it in different ways, but that is the message. And as you can tell, it is making inroads even beyond the circles of converts and sympathizers of the Islamic revolution. Now, of course, one of the things that Iran does, it's appropriating the Palestinian cause and making itself the true champion of the most extreme Palestinian positions. The International Quds Day is one of the uh, vectors that Iran uses to do that. You can see here two examples of events, uh, one from El Salvador on the left and one from Venezuela on the right. You can see how these events are done in cooperation with uh, other NGOs, some of which are actually also Iranian front, Ababil being one, but you get the point. Um, uh, and here you have more uh, visual examples from social media in, in Rio de Janeiro on the left uh, and in uh, um, uh, Venezuela through the main uh, Iranian center in Caracas on the right. This is a photograph from the Al-Quds March on the International Day of Al-Quds in 2017 in the center of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Again, the organizer, uh, a Brazilian imam who studied in Com under Rabbani, leading, organizing and leading the march. And this takes us to academia, which I mentioned, but it's important to uh, dwell upon it for a couple of minutes because that is the next step. You can only convert so many people, but you can mobilize uh, you know, radical left-wing students who may not be attracted to Shia Islam per se, but may be attracted to the political causes that Iran promotes. And that's a backdoor to get to them and to gain more support among the youngsters. And so Iran has begun now to create um, uh, uh, study centers in universities or scholarships, exchange programs, seminars through Al Mustafa once again. And you can see it here at the bottom of the announcement on the left, um, in the sort of left bottom corner right here, sponsoring these events, oftentimes in conjunction with the embassy. This is the announcement of the establishment of a, of a chair uh, in uh, social, cultural, and geopolitical studies for Latin America and the Middle East, named after Qasem Soleimani at the Bolivarian University in uh, Venezuela. And these are the activities that then they promote the International Forum on Palestine, Geopolitics of a Genocide, Cathedra Soleimani. So this becomes a tool for propaganda in the uh, academic sphere. Once again, Al Mustafa is part of this. Um, this is a, uh, an event that took place in Bolivia uh, in October, 2020, at the height of the pandemic. You have the program for this very sort of seemingly benign uh, and slightly esoteric uh, uh, seminar at a university just outside La Paz. But you can see among the participants that you have Spanish sounding names linked to Al University, an indication of exchange programs, and that you have, of course, the presence of Iranian professors 
also giving lectures. And also, just to add to the mix, you also have Cubans uh, alongside the rest. So this is the Bolivarian um, Islamic Revolutionary Alliance coming together in Latin America through universities. And here is another example, this one involving also a center in Mexico. A lot of these events, of course, are online because of the pandemics, but the pandemic, but eventually they can become uh, instruments for scholars to travel and meet at different universities and amplify the message. Now, beyond the confines and the comfort of campuses, you have the media. And Iran, of course, has been investing through Al Mustafa and its followers and, and, and recruits into local media platforms that are run locally by locals with local messaging, but with the intention of promoting uh, the Iranian agenda. And you can see here some examples, Argentina, uh, Anur TV and Fatima TV and Radio TV Al Mahdi, Radio Islamica do Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, Radio El Minarete in El Salvador, and of course, Hispan TV, the jewel in the crown, uh, the uh, global uh, news network run by Iran and produced entirely in Spanish. And you can see from the samples here, what is the type of material that they're producing. And I just focused on what you know has been occupying us in the last few months. Uh, something that, by the way, of course, has nothing to do with the revolution or with Israel, uh, but it tells you what this channel is about. These are four headlines about, uh, with the exception of one, of course, so the, the bottom one about you know the West closing its their eyes uh, in, uh, in the face of genocide by Israel in Palestine but you have pretty much everything else focusing on Russia and Ukraine. And instead of providing uh, objective reporting, this is a propaganda channel that supports 100% the propaganda line of the Kremlin. Uh, and then there are experts, of course, that are used to amplify this message. Some of them are the sheikhs themselves, but many others are graduates of uh, uh, Al Mustafa once again, and they conjoin in their efforts and activities with leftist recruits from what they themselves call the anti-imperialist front. I just present, present here to you two examples. Juan Carlos Rosso, a Venezuelan, who runs a program called Causa Palestina on Hispan TV and came from the experience of Bolivarian pro-Maduro, pro-Chavez channels, Telesur and Globovision. And the other one is the probably better known Paulo Iglesias, a member of the ruling coalition today in Spain, um, but previously a, an Iranian paid host for a talk show called Forte Apache on Hispan TV. And here, you know, we get to the connections with Hezbollah, which are profound, and, 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 and important. And I know I'm, I've, I've over, overstayed my welcome and, and taken too much time. So let me just show you one example uh, to conclude. The Sheikh you've seen in the previous screen here at the center, Sheikh Ghassan Abdallah, is one of the three religious leaders who runs the Iranian sponsored Islamic Center in Santiago de Chile, in Chile. But he is also. Uh, a sheikh in the tri-border area. He's Lebanese, and he's the brother of one um, uh, Hezbollah financier that Treasury sanctioned in 2006. So it, he's clearly connected to Hezbollah. By the way, the name of the mosque he serves in in Forstu Gazu is the Imam Khomeini Mosque. Okay, it's like you know, if you encounter ever an Adolf Hitler cultural center. You shouldn't have much doubt about what their political leanings are, right? Okay. So what's interesting here is that on social media, he connects with the sheikh, Lebanese sheikh that runs the main Shia mosque in the Ivory Coast in Abidjan. And why is this important? Because according to Treasury, Al-Qaeda al-Hassan, a financial institution 
linked to Hezbollah is basically a conduit for terror finance. It's been sanctioned. And in 2020, hackers leaked information about al Qaeda al Hassan, and it turns out that Ghalib Khojok, the Shia uh, mosque leader in Abidjan, is one of the main contributor financiers to Hezbollah from West Africa. So now you can see how this is not just a local network, it is a global network that links to everything, to Iran's propaganda, to Iran's terror cells, to Iran's Supreme Office of the Supreme Leader, to Hezbollah, and so on. And all of this comes together and it is the context in which we need to try and interpret and understand based on the public information we have, what is going on with the plane down in Argentina. As I told you, my theory is that the plane is a disguise. It, this is Iran sending very senior regime officials to expand the reach and the strength and ability of these networks. And it is no surprise that it would be so because they're using one of their top senior figures. Just to make it drive it home, you don't send Jeff Bezos to drive Amazon trying trucks around to deliver goods to customers. And just like you don't send Jeff Bezos, you don't send the senior member of the board of an important logistics cargo operation that serves the purposes of the IRGC and support for terrorism just to fly a plane that carries uh, measly merchandise. The reason is expanding these networks and it is yet one more disguise that the Iranians use to expand their influence in the region. Thank you so much. Here and thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you so much, Emanuele. You never have to apologize for talking on. What you have to um, say is so important for everyone. Um, I just, I have, if I have time for one question, I'm not quite sure um, what the time limits are right now, but um, one particular question is we know that in Chile, there recently was the election of Gabriel Barak. Um, I know that in Brazil, it was um, Ignacio Lula de Silva. Um, we're having um, what seems like a sweep of leftist, um, very, uh, very hostile regimes to the United States and probably very welcoming to um, this sort of recruitment from the Hezbollah network. Could you speak a little bit about these recent elections throughout Latin America? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, the good news is the, uh, the swing to the left uh, uh, of many of these countries is unrelated to these activities. I mean, it really has to do with local circumstances. Uh, um, these countries, especially the poor sectors of these societies have been hardly, uh, the hardest hit by the consequences of the pandemic. And so there is a lot of discontent and, and that is compounded of course, by the rise in prices, especially for the agricultural sector now with the Ukrainian war. And these countries will still rely heavily uh, on their agricultural sector. So these are local factors by and large, but they bring to power people who ideologically are closer to the Iran worldview and more sympathetic to either Iran or some of the causes that Iran represents than their predecessors. Chile is an interesting case. I don't think that Boric aligns with the Bolivarians. Uh, he's been very cr critical of Venezuela and Nicaragua because of their poor or abysmal human rights record, but he has a soft spot for some of the typical global uh, progressive left-wing causes, Palestine, the Palestinians being one of them, and Chile uh, is a peculiar, has a peculiar set of circumstances, has one of the largest Palestinian diasporas in the world, and the Iranians have been working for years to radicalize them. So these things create opportunities. Whether Lula becomes president in Brazil uh, later this year, we don't know yet, but the signs are uh, highly suggestive of that. 
And that could open the door. I mean, Lula never shut the door to the United States uh, or to Israel in a way, in the same way that say Venezuela and Bolivia have done. But he will take a foreign policy that is a lot more, as they call it, uh, equidistant, uh, more attuned to the non-aligned movement stance. Uh, there is a history of corruption, as we all know, behind Lula, uh, and uh, and that could could also open doors for more nefarious activities. And certainly when it comes to Iran's nefarious activities in the region, they have always closed an eye. So each country is different, but this trend is certainly more beneficial to Iranian designs than the contrary. Right. Okay. And um, if we have a minute um, to turn the podium over to Hussein, who um, has been fielding the questions that have come in, Hussein. Thank you, thank you, Marissa, and thank you very much, Emmanuel, for, for such an amazing uh, presentation. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna try to compound a lot of the questions we received. And uh, I think I'm, I'm speaking for all of our audience when, when I say that you know I feel alarmed. Uh, so as you may imagine, a lot of the questions that we've received actually have to do with what's being done about this. Uh, first of all, those governments of both Latin American uh, countries, uh, are they simply bought off by Iran? They just don't care about uh, radicalization and indoctrination into this transnational ideology that has political loyalty to a different state? Um, how about the Catholic Church? Where is, where, you know, we're under the impression that, you know, the Catholic Church actually now one of the strongest prisons is, is in places like Latin America and Africa and so on. Are they not doing anything about this conversion into radical uh, Shiism? Are there any other groups uh, or is the United States government doing anything about this? Let me start with, the, these are great questions, by the way. Uh, and I wish I had another hour to, to speak about them. Maybe next time. But um, the Catholic Church uh, is a great starting point because the Catholic Church um, in Latin America, and, you know, they're, as always, you know, this is a vast continent with different countries. I mean, the fact that they share a language mostly does not mean that they're all the same. Um, but the Catholic Church has two problems in Latin America. The first is uh, the theology of liberation, that there is a component of the church, especially in Latin America, that for historical reasons has uh, aligned with um, a sort of a, a blend of uh, you know, uh, social justice doctrine from the church and, and, and Marxism. So there is a soft spot for left-wing movements. The second uh, factor is that when it comes to conversion of Catholics, the vast majority of Latin Americans, to another religion, what the church fears the most is the evangelicals, because there you have a vast movement across the, the Western Hemisphere, south of the Mexican-U.S. border, where Catholics are becoming evangelicals of all sorts of denominations. That is the concern of the church. When we're looking at the Iranian operation, we're not talking about millions of converts. We're talking about small numbers. This is a very Marxist approach, the creation of cells and a vanguard uh, an elite vanguard of revolutionaries. So the numbers are small, carefully selected and vetted. And so the numbers don't register with the church. So what you see the church doing when it comes to Islam, and the Iranians are masters of this, it is the promotion of multicultural, religious, multi-faith, interfaith dialogue, in which the Iranians always get to say the two Abrahamic religions conjoined uh, in dialogue and reconciliation. The third one is maybe inconvenient for both, and so it's left out. So you have, uh, you have that element. Um, I think that when you move from the church to the government, again, there is a combination of neglect, ignorance, complicity, and unwillingness to act, especially if the alerts come from the north, from the US, right? They will tell you, this is religion, it's freedom of religion. We are societies open to immigration and multicultural. We tolerate everybody. We let them do whatever they want. We don't see the connection between, you know, 
translating the Quran and religious texts into Spanish on the one hand and terrorism on the other. So there is a, a bit of ignorance, uh, a bit of negligence, and to some extent there may also be collusion and corruption. Certainly there are cases with, which we have seen in the past where the Iranian influence op through a mixture of um, alluring opportunities and hard cash buys politician to sponsor their activities. And in some countries like Bolivia, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela, as you know, the regime is ideologically aligned with Iran there. And so it's all done in the open with the full cooperation uh, of the local government. So depending on, on the circumstances, you have different explanations. What can be done? One thing that can be done is a very systematic effort to identify all the people that Iran has converted over the years. And it's actually not that hard because they're on social media. I mentioned the fact that this is a kind of a, Iran promotes a, a Shia version of the Che Guevara Pan-American anti-imperialistic uh, ideology, right? Break the artificial boundaries created by the conquistadors. Um, we're all Latin Americans. And so, but we don't live in the same latitude or time zone. So they're connected through social media platforms. So it's easy to identify them. Also, the Iranians promote this activity. They take pride in their accomplishments. They made, um, a few years back on Ispan TV, they made a, a, a series of documentaries, deadly boring, I watched them all. And you know, each one of them is a half an hour uh, episode where they interview three or four converts in Costa Rica, in Peru, and wherever they are. And they tell you who they are. And the, the converts, of course, say, I was unhappy. I didn't have a job. I was an alcoholic. I was overweight. But then I found Islam and now I'm thin. I work. I'm happy. I, you know, I don't drink anymore. And I found a spouse. So, and it's a very interesting sort of um, appropriation of how some evangelical messaging is done. It's the, it looks very similar. But the point is that information is there. So let's start by identifying these people because these people are in a position where it will be much easier for them to travel to the United States. And that is an important point. They can be used as messengers, as mules, as connectors, as super spreaders of ideas, as influencers, and have access to the US in a way that of course Iranian and, and Hezbollah Lebanese agents don't. So that's just one idea of where we can start. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. This was um, very sobering and depressing, but enlightening. And we are so grateful for your wisdom and all your endless years of, of arduous work on this subject. Um, we'd like to um, invite our listeners to um, sponsor some of these webinars. Each webinar costs us and our staff a great deal of time, effort, energy, and expense. Um, so please consider um, sponsoring a future AMET webinar featuring wonderful top experts and going to um, ametonline.org. Also kindly um, consider sponsoring fdd.org that does fabulous work and their um, wonderful um, scholars are always willing um, to speak for a met in a pinch and we're incredibly grateful for their excellent scholarship and work. Um, thank you so much. Please join us next week when we will be um, sponsoring a commemoration of 21 years since the horrible Sparrow Pizza bombing in Jerusalem um, with Arnold Roth, the father of a 15-year-old beautiful girl, Maki Roth, who was killed in that horrible bombing. So thanks very, very much. And um, we will see you next um, Wednesday, um, August 10th at 12 noon. Thank you very, very much. Bye -bye now.